Good afternoon. On behalf of the Ford School of Public Policy, it is my pleasure to welcome you to our seventh webinar event for the North American Colloquium on Climate Policy series. Thanks also to the International Policy Center for your collaboration. The North American Colloquium is an ongoing collaboration between the Ford School, the University of Toronto's Monk School, and the Centro de Investigaciones sobre América del Norte at the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. I would also like to acknowledge the generous support of the Meany Family Foundation for making this year's programming possible. Today's event focuses on what some of the largest North American cities are doing in response to climate change. First, we'll hear from Sarah Hughes, who will discuss research from her book, Repowering Cities. Then we'll hear from Giancarlo Delgado Ramos, who with co-author Hilda Blanco will discuss their comparative case study of urban water infrastructure in Mexico City and Los Angeles. As audience members, you may ask a question in writing using the Q&A feature on your Zoom control panel. Uh, we'll get to as many of your questions as possible, but apologies if we cannot get to all of them. We may go about 15 minutes beyond the scheduled end time of 2 p.m. Eastern time to accommodate as many of your questions as possible. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sarah Hughes. <clears throat> Sarah Hughes is an assistant professor in the School for Environment and Sustainability right here at the University of Michigan. She directs the Water and Climate Policy Lab. Her research focuses on urban climate change and water policy, politics, and governance. Her book, Repowering Cities, critically evaluates the governing strategies to meet ambitious GHG reduction targets and the consequences of these efforts. And before I turn it over to Sarah, I should also mention she has the distinction of being connected with two of the three NAC partner universities, having been an assistant professor at the University of Toronto prior to her arrival here in Ann Arbor. So Sarah, it's all yours. Great, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to present on this work and be part of this conversation. It's very exciting. Um, and I wish I could see all my, my colleagues, but uh, another time and another, another format. Um, so let me pull up my slides here. Uh, so as Josh said, um, we're focusing on urban climate governance in North America, and and in in my talk today, I'm gonna I'm gonna focus in on one specific dimension of this, or this idea of implementation through collaboration and coalition. So implementing uh, some of these ambitious climate goals at the urban scale, and what that looks like from a governance perspective. Um, so. I think it's pretty easy to point to a lot of examples of urban leadership on climate policy in North America. In a lot of ways, um, you know, cities have been leading on climate policy or at least engaging in climate policy since there was such a thing as climate policy. Um, one of the very first uh, international meetings on the climate and the climate challenge took place in Toronto in 1988, the World Conference on the Changing Atmosphere. Uh, leading up to that meeting, Toronto set a, green, a greenhouse gas emission reduction target for itself. Cities like Seattle and Portland followed suit quickly after. Um, we have, there's so many examples I could give. I'll give just a few here of some of what some of this leadership has looked like in the, in the years following. Um, we've got uh, former mayor of New York City, Michael Bloomberg, who led uh, what's been called one of the more ambitious climate, urban climate change plans, Plan YC, and now serves as a special envoy to the United Nations on climate action and ambition, I think his title is called. Uh, Mexico City held a meeting of mayors ahead of the uh, COP in Cancun that led to the Mexico City Pact, an agreement among global mayors to, to track greenhouse gas emissions, adopt ambitious uh, greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets. Today we've got um, almost 150 cities in the U.S. that have committed to 100% renewable energy. Uh, hundreds of cities signed the we're still in uh, pact or, or, or agreement after President Trump, former President Trump, uh, announced his plans to withdraw from the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, so we've got a lot of examples for 
kind of local leadership on climate policy, a lot of ambition, a lot of goals that have, and targets that have been set ahead of and sometimes in spite of any action at the state or federal levels. Um, and so there's been a lot written about why that might be the case, you know, whether cities are trying to capture some of the, the co-benefits of, of re reducing climate or reducing greenhouse gas emissions, you know, some of the political benefits of this kind of leadership, um, you know, either political benefits thinking upward, you know, in terms of um, affecting policy at other levels or simply in terms of reelection prospects. Um, but in reality, once you, <laughs> once the ink has dried on, on these, on these targets and on these goals, the cities face the real challenge of having to implement policies that will really transition them into cities that uh, use, you know, are producing significantly uh, less greenhouse gas emissions. And once we start to unpack what that looks like from a policy and a governance perspective, um, I think we can start to understand, you know, the real challenge that cities face once, you know, kind of moving from policy to implementation. So um, urban emissions come from four primary sectors or kind of four primary sources, right? Sort of where energy is generated and how energy is generated. Uh, what energy demand looks like uh, in terms of building energy use in cities, the transportation systems uh, that move people around in cities, and to a lesser degree, uh, waste management systems in cities as well. So when we start thinking about what it means to actually, you know, meet some of these goals and actually reduce emissions, it, it requires really getting into and unpacking the, these specific um, uh, policy sectors within cities. And as Josh mentioned, that question or this question of you know, what it looks like to then start engaging really ambitiously and in new ways in these policy sectors uh, was the question that led me to take up this book project that um, is now out in the world, Repowering Cities. But really I wanted to know how do cities go from you know, setting these ambitious policies to actually trying to meet, to meet their goals. Um, you know, at the time, it felt like we were spending too much time uh, patting cities on the back for their leadership and not enough time uh, trying to make sense of what it all what it all added up to. Um, and as somebody who studies uh, urban governance and policymaking, I found that to be particularly interesting as well. So, you know, what does it look like to go from city A to city B? Um, you know, what are the policymaking processes and strategies that, that are involved? Like I said, as someone who studies cities and urban governance, um, I came at this question um, kind of wanting to take a step back and think about, okay, well, how do cities govern? You know, what, what do we know about urban governance and how that works generally in ways that could inform our understanding of urban climate policy more specifically? Um, so, so in urban, in urban governance literature and theory, our basic, our basic assumption going into it is that city governments have incomplete authority and limited capacities. And this is an assumption we generally start from regardless of the national context we're working in, um, whether it's you know, cities in the US where we might generally think that we might generally think enjoy um, relatively more formal authority than in other places, or you know, cities in Canada where we typically think of cities as having relatively less formal authority in both contexts, our assumption is that that authority is incomplete and, and capacities are not um, are, are also limited. And that by necessity, then urban governance takes place through collaboration and coalition building. Um, and this is a quote I love from a, a kind of grandfather of urban governance um, that really ur at the heart of urban governance is that the task of crafting arrangements through which resources can be mobilized, thus enabling a community to accomplish difficult and non-routine goals. And I think, uh, you know, the idea of transitioning to a carbon neutral city or to completely revamping the way that people move throughout uh, a metropolis could be uh, fairly called a difficult or non-routine goal. So we're starting out from the with the premise that, um, 
you know, that this, this kind of mobilization, collaboration and coalition building is going to be at the heart of what, um, what this governance looks like. So then uh, from this, we can think then that, or assume that climate policy implementation strategies and successes will be a product of the coalitions and collaborations that are formed, that are possible, that are feasible, that are realized, um, that our understanding of, the, of both implementation strategies and their outcomes will have something to do with, with this coalition building and collaboration making. And in this way, I think this is where in, in some ways we can bring back that national context um, in that it's helping to shape the opportunities and formations for coalition building um, rather than necessarily thinking about them just as determining formal authorities. So in the book, I explore some of these ideas in three specific North American cities, New York City, Los Angeles, and Toronto. And these were really um, exciting cases for me because they were all three fairly early actors in terms of setting clear um, and relatively ambitious greenhouse gas emissions targets for themselves. So they had all uh, put out these big plans in 2007 with, with relatively similar targets for reducing their city's emissions. And so the advantage here being that they allowed th that it was reasonable to start asking questions about implementation. You know, cities that have gotten a more recent start, you know, we might not have the same expectations, but these are cities where we should expect to be seeing some action and be expect to be able to say something about the implementation process. Um, in terms of, you know, their emissions profiles and what they look like from a greenhouse gas emissions perspective, um, in terms of emissions intensities, all three cities are, are kind of middle of the pack, let's say, in terms of, you know, these global city profiles. Um, you know, they're, they're in that same, let's say, kind of seven to 10 um, tons per capita range. But they have different profiles uh, when you you know uh, when you break it down by sector. So in New York City, for example, public transit and walking, you know, um, active transit are are much more prevalent. So building energy use plays a larger role in the city's greenhouse gas emission profile. Where in Los Angeles and Toronto, uh, transportation systems are more um, reliant on on cars, single passenger vehicles even. So the transportation networks there uh, make up a larger portion of the emissions profiles. Um, and there are also some really interesting and, and in some ways maybe unexpected differences in terms of what authorities the cities do have um, to, to tackle their emissions. And this is where I think some of the interesting variation comes out in thinking about you know, where those limitations are in terms of both institutions and capacities and that they're, they can look very different in very different cities um, and maybe not always in the ways we would expect. So New York City, for example, it's one of the strongest city governments maybe in the world. It has a very strong mayor system. Um, and, and was, was fairly committed, had a moderately progressive state to back it up. But, in, but its jurisdiction specific to its energy system and transportation system is fairly limited. So while overall we think of it as a strong city government specifically related to its energy network and transportation network, the authority is quite limited. Whereas in Los Angeles, we have what's typically considered a weak mayor city government um, and in a, in a very, but a very progressive state. Uh, the advantage Los Angeles has is it has an entirely uh, city owned energy utility. So it's got, it owns the largest energy utility, I think in North America, for sure in the US, um, but the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power uh, is this huge municipally owned energy utility that the city has, you know, kind of full, full access and full power over. And then Toronto, Again, we've got what's considered a pretty, a pretty weak city government um, in terms of its authority generally, but one advantage is that it has is uh, it has a city run transit system or it plays a large role in its in its transit system through the TTC. And when we look at what the cities are, are actually doing in terms of the policies they're putting in place, the strategies they're working on 
to reduce their emissions. Um, you know, we see them taking advantage of these particular opportunities. So we see them tailoring their strategies both to their emissions profiles and to their kind of formal levers of power. So uh, New York City is putting a lot of energy, <laughs> no pun intended, a lot of effort into um, improving energy efficiency in its building stock, right? We saw that big bar uh, for you know the role that building energy use is playing. And it's also a place the city has a lot of authority. They did some kind of early experiments with transportation emissions. I don't know if anyone had ever followed um, Bloomberg's failed attempt to implement uh, congestion pricing, but they ran up to the limits of their authority on transportation very early on. Los Angeles, you know, they're taking full advantage of their utility, providing a lot of uh, both large and small scale solar directly through the LADWP. They were also successful in securing new funding for public transit, which I'll, I'll talk about again in a little bit. Um, and Toronto has been really creative about using the levers that it does have to make it easier for other actors to take the steps needed to reduce emissions um, and engaging directly in in, in systems where they can, things like the, their, their waste recovery uh, programs um, and things like this. So I wanna talk about, um, so in this slide, right, I'm kind of talking about the what the cities are doing. You know, what did they do? What programs did they have? You know, what policies were they, were they doing? Were they, were they trying to put into place? Um, but I think what we want to know really when it comes to these governance questions and these implementation questions is how did these come about? You know, what were the strategies underlying these policies that led them to be? You know, how, how did we get new funding for transportation? I think a lot of cities would like to know the answer to that, right? So that's, that's really where I was, um, have, been trying to, have been trying to push on is think about um, not just what cities are doing, but the, stra the political strategies and, and policymaking strategies that allowed them to take these steps. So I'll give some of my favorite examples um, from each of, of the cities. Uh, I'm trying to keep an eye on my time as well here. Um, so New York City, my favorite example of this um, is kind of governing through collaboration and coalition building is the is the green codes task force and so this was a task force the city put together of real estate stakeholders you know building engineers um, as well as people from the city environmental groups um, and kind of gave them the task of identifying all the different ways the city's building code could be updated to reduce emissions um, and even though the city itself had the authority to just do it, you know, they, they, they write their own building codes, um, you know, they specifically use this task force model in order to, you know, first of all, access the expertise they needed, but also to make sure that they had buy-in from these stakeholders for all the changes that would be coming down the pike and to ensure implementation, ensure once things were put in place that, um, you know, that they were actually going to become part of the city's building stock. Um, it was a really successful process. It led to the passage of more than 100 what were called green bills that updated the city's building code. Um, and a legislative analyst I interviewed called it one of the most collaborative processes I've ever been a part of. Um, and so it really also set the stage where um, you know, the city, New York City replicated this task force model across a number of its climate initiatives. And it's also been exported to other cities as a, as a kind of good, good model for, um, uh, for, for, for doing the work necessary to, like I said, access the expertise, generate buy-in and ensure implementation. My favorite example from Los Angeles was this effort to get um, more transit funding for the city. So of course, Los Angeles is notorious for its traffic congestion, its reliance on cars, um, its kind of paltry public transit system. Um, and so there had been efforts previous to this to raise new revenue for public transit funding, uh, but 2008 was the first time it was, it was successful. So with, uh, the, the goal was to increase sales tax by half of a percent uh, to dedicate to transportation projects. It passed by referendum, so it required this public referendum to go into place. Um, passed by referendum by 0.4%, um, really the thinnest of margins um, 
it, it was successful. But uh, the reason it worked this time around was in, in part, you know, I don't want to give all the credit, but in part, you know, the mayor, the LA mayor at the time, Villaraigosa, really worked hard to um, champion the effort to build a coalition of environmental, labor, commerce, real estate, neighborhood organizations, really anyone who stood to benefit from transit really got out there and um, you know, made the case and, and got the support needed to, uh, to get this passed. Like I said, the, a similar effort both before and since uh, was not successful, but in this case, the push really worked. Um, and the city was able to, um, county actually was able to get this funding in place. The other piece of this was that, um, you know, it takes a long time for a half percent sales tax to accumulate into enough to, for big spending on infrastructure projects. So uh, at the time, VRA Gosa also lobbied Congress to pass what's called the Moving America Faster Bill. And what this did is it allowed the federal government to lend out the capital needed for these projects with the idea that it's then repaid once the once the funding does accrue from, from these new funding sources. So, so really did kind of working in, in multiple directions to get to get this funding in place. And the projects are the projects are are, are being built. And then my favorite example from, from Toronto is this Towerwise project. Um, and so like I said, Toronto's been really creative about thinking about ways they can help facilitate the kind of action other people need to take because their, their, their authorities are, are relatively limited. Um, but this is a really neat project. It's a collaboration between um, the Toronto Community Housing Corporation that's in charge of social um, low-income housing in the city, the Toronto Atmospheric Fund, who plays a large role in the greenhouse gas emissions projects, um, and the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. And so uh, they work together to uh, get the funds aligned and get the um, partnerships aligned. Um, they developed an energy performance standard revolving fund. And so what this does is it provided a way for um, building retrofits to be deep, deep building retrofits in these social housing buildings to be performed um, upfront and repaid by the subsequent um, energy and water savings down the road. So they developed a, a, a both the fund and the kind of tracking and monitoring system necessary to uh, make make it make the payback system possible. So they ultimately uh, completed deep retrofits on seven of these buildings and are currently uh, kind of scaling out the experience into other other provinces. Uh, so just to wrap up a little bit, I mean, this is a, it's a kind of high level tour of. Um, of some of the, my favorite highlights of, of urban climate governance in these in these cases. Um, I wanted to just say a couple of things about, about where we go from here, kind of um, what I see as some of the interesting questions going forward. Um, so, you know, in my work, I've seen that these cities, I think it's fair to say that they're largely on track at the moment. You know, they've seen between 20 and 30% greenhouse gas emissions reductions at this point, but I think, um, they're all kind of facing this challenge now of scaling up. You know, where how do we how do we kind of go to the next level if we're gonna to, in order to stay on track um, for the next ten years, kind of thing. Um, and some of the strategies underway are you know expanding the coalition partners that cities are working with. They're starting to look, I think, more actively now for for support from higher levels of government to help with that scaling and new sources of funding trying out some pilot projects and, and experimentation to help you know, uh, develop that proof of principle. But I think one important way a lot of this is, is manifesting right now is in this, this sort of next generation of climate planning that's taking place in each of these cities, and I think in a lot of cities, um, is, a, is a reorienting of, of these climate plans around issues of environmental justice, social sustainability, racial equity. Um, both LA and New York City have rebranded their climate plans as the Green New Deal for their cities. Um, and uh, Toronto's made a similar move with their planning. Um, but I think this is, this is where 
uh, urban climate governance is headed at the moment um, is is engaging more more significantly with um, with broader issues of equity and justice in the cities. And so I think there will be some interesting dynamics to 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 track and engage with, you know, as cities work to build novel coalitions across environmental and, and kind of social equity focused groups and issues and policymaking and and agencies, you know, within the cities even. So I think there's going to be a lot happening there. Even uh, I saw recently there's a new paper uh, Harriet Bulkley just put out where she's even referring to this potentially as the third wave of climate urbanism, um, seeing some of these same dynamics emerge globally where uh, there's just more and more uh, linking being done between, between climate and justice issues in the city. Um, the, second, the second kind of big question or issue I would put forward, you know, we talk a lot, I think, in the urban climate governance space about inner city learning. You know, we've got a lot of inner city networks. We've got the ICLEI, we've got C40. We talk a lot about learning that takes place in those networks. And one thing I've been trying to advocate for is that this learning not only focus on the what, you know, on, on those, those, those specific projects and policies, but the how, you know, what were the strategies that worked? How did you build the code? coalitions that you needed um, to get this through? What did the politics look like for you and what worked? Um, and finding ways for that kind of learning to take place as well. Leave it there. I look forward to the discussion. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was very, very interesting uh, to get that kind of look at the city level in all three cities. So um, uh, in a moment, I'm going to introduce our next uh, presenter, Giancarlo Delgado Ramos. But before I do, I just want to mention that unfortunately, due to some technical difficulties, as happens in the COVID era, um, due to some computer problems, his co-author, Hilda Blanco from the University of Southern California, uh, was not able to join. They had originally planned to split the presentation uh, with John speaking mostly about Mexico City and Hilda speaking mostly about Los Angeles. But uh, Gian's gonna do his best, but uh, just a warning that the Los Angeles side might not be in as much detail. Um, both of them will be available by email if you have questions about Los Angeles. Um, so at this point, I will introduce Giancarlo Delgado Ramos. He is an economist with a background in ecological economics, environmental management, and environmental science. He's a full-time researcher at UNAM, the National Autonomous University of Mexico, which of course is our Mexican partner for the North American Colloquium. He has published three dozen academic books, more than 50 book chapters, and more than 200 articles, extremely productive scholar. He was a lead author of the fifth assessment review of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and is currently involved with the IPCC's sixth assessment report. And he's gonna talk about urban water infrastructure in uh, the two cities. Gian? Please unmute. Yeah. Yes. Hey, thank you, Joshua. Thank you very for the invitation. And Sarah, it's nice to share this uh, conversation with you. Uh, I'm I'm gonna launch first the the presentation. And um, before I do start, um, I wanted to make a, a very brief comment on uh, the narrative from Sarah uh, because it was very interesting to to see what is going on in uh, Canadian and uh, North American cities and a lot of the challenges that uh, were presented uh, are shared uh, with at least with the, the the mega city and the big cities of uh, Mexico uh, but there are certain aspects that are uh, different that are very diff uh, very interesting as well uh, this a uh, a convergence of a percentage of a, a greenhouse gas emission reductions and commitments uh, are not the same in our cities. Our cities are more about a, a number of tons rather than percentage. So when we make the maths, uh, the, the commitments are not that strong. And uh, uh, we will see what happens in, in the case of Mexico City that is preparing its new uh, uh, climate change uh, program that uh, should be uh, known publicly very soon. So I just wanted to, to, to say that because even though that we share a lot of the, the same difficulties, uh, a lot of the, the, the challenges, it, the, the context it, it, that is uh, diverse 
uh, uh, between Canada, United States, and Mexico makes more appealing the, the discussion. Uh, perhaps for us, uh, scaling up uh, uh, the coalitions, uh, it's important, but before that, we need to uh, build and develop a, a local capacities uh, at all levels, not only institutional, uh, at the institutional level. Uh, anyway, so I'm just gonna uh, go uh, directly into our uh, presentation for the case of of uh, the water and climate change. Uh, and the first thing that I want to uh, say uh, in kind of uh, an introduction of the topic is that uh, usually cities are dependent of uh, not just their own basin, but uh, different uh, uh, basins, either for uh, taking fresh water or to discharge uh, wastewater. So this connection of different basins to uh, to cover the demand of and securing uh, uh, water for cities, it's uh, it's uh, very important because then planning uh, is related more to uh, a basin level planning rather than local or just local planning. Um, uh, of course, with urban expansion and uh, the the expansion of infrastructure for uh, either uh, channeling water flows, uh, inflows and outflows of, of water into the city. This idea of the basic sanitary city uh, that spell uh, constantly water, demands and spells con constantly water, uh, has resulted in a lot of uh, problems. Uh, water resources have been lost. There is a depletion of, of water resources. There is an intense consumption of energy that's very important for uh, our case studies, uh, particularly Mexico. Uh, and uh, this increasing sprawling of uh, cities is uh, um, increasing financial costs uh, for, uh, of course, expanding the system, but also for uh, operating the system. Um, and there's a lot of uh, uh, the, uh, struggles, uh, contesting processes that are being, uh, that are happening in our cities, um, either because uh, water depletion, and uh, water appropriation, uh, that's the case of Mexico, a, a third of the water, we will see that, but a third of the water uh, that is uh, consumed in Mexico City is imported and uh, that water is taken from indigenous communities. So there, there are uh, struggles related to that. There are struggles related to uh, uh, water price, uh, water tariffs, and uh, there is also conflicts in relation to the uh, use uh, or the right of using wastewater. That's very peculiar for the case of Mexico City. Um, and uh, this context, uh, makes that the resolution of the UN General Assembly takes a, a, a lot of importance in terms of the need of securing uh, the right, the human right of, uh, to water and sanitation uh, in a context that that human right, it's, it's, uh, it's being uh, compromised. So uh, ecological crisis, overexploitation of water resources, are a compromise in, I say, availability and quality of fresh water, and that impacts the, uh, the quality of public services uh, uh, on, on water. Uh, and in addition to that, climate change will uh, have an impact on water availability, but also in terms of a, a water risk reliability. So there is a lot of uh, things happening at the same time, and the challenge in relation to water, urban water is, is huge. It's not only about uh, building tubes and uh, offering uh, water to uh, the residents, but it, it covers a lot of other issues. Um, so uh, in relation to this climate uh, um, impact uh, to uh, fresh water resources, there is a, a, a publication by the IPCC uh, from 2008 that uh, kind of make a balance of uh, the key uh, current vulnerabilities in relation to freshwater resources and uh, the future climate change impacts related uh, also to uh, freshwater. And uh, we can see that we share at least uh, a part of the uh, United States and Mexico and uh, perhaps just a, a bit of the, uh, of the south of Canada. We uh, share uh, vulnerabilities and impacts, and uh, certainly 
we share uh, between Los Angeles and the, the north and center of uh, part of, the, of, of Mexico. So uh, addressing urban water security in this uh, changing context uh, requires to consider local hydroclimate variables and existing interactions with coupled human water systems. So this is pretty much what we uh, try to address in this uh, chapter that uh, we published uh, a couple of two or three years ago uh, uh, that I grow with uh, Ilda Blanco. Uh, and we try to find out the, the similarities and uh, how we can learn from one case and the other uh, in order to move towards uh, a climate ready uh, water systems, not to say water infrastructure only. So I'm just gonna start, start with the, the case of Mexico City. That's the one that I, I know best. Uh, and in order to contextualize uh, the case study, I wanted to first uh, talk about the, the implications of uh, urban expansion in, in Mexico. Uh, we are already a, a country that is uh, highly urbanized. Uh, about 78% of the population lives in some of the uh, more than 350 cities that uh, uh, have been uh, legally recognized in, in Mexico. You know that the, the, the um, parameters to define what is urban and rural uh, changes uh, uh, country to country, but in the case of Mexico, we are uh, near the 400 uh, uh, cities. And uh, the expectation is that the, the population is going to increase all the way to 90%. Uh, this will mean uh, different challenges. On one hand, that uh, the mega city of Mexico City will, uh, hi Ilda, <laughs> uh, the mega city of, uh, 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 of our country, Mexico City, will lose a, a weight a, in terms of total urban population. A, big cities as Guadalajara, Monterrey, that are between one to five million a, a, a inhabitants right now, but a, they will be between five to 10 million in the, in the a, well, until the middle of the century, a, will a, gather more weight. But mostly, is, is small, mid-sized cities are going to be increasingly relevant uh, in the country. Uh, so that's one of the, the, the first uh, uh, phenomena that we're going to experience. The second one is that in relation to that expansion of uh, urban population, we're going to see uh, a physical expansion of cities. And as uh, you can see in, in both of the, well, in the, in the graphic that is on the left, uh, you can see how uh, this uh, projection of a different size of cities and uh, population and a built environment, uh, environment area is going to increase uh, by uh, 2050. And of course, that expansion is related to uh, a increase of uh, a consumption of uh, materials and energy. In this case, we made the calculations uh, for a, a current uh, um, report that we are uh, preparing for UNEP uh, on the weight of cities in Latin America and the Caribbean. And uh, for the case of Mexico, uh, the DMC, that's the domestic material consumption that includes uh, locally produced uh, material and energy uh, that it's uh, consumed in, in, in the country, uh, plus the, the uh, importations. Um, so that that uh, consumption is going to increase. We, we present three different um, scenarios in the graphic. Uh, I, I don't have the time to explain those, but are related to uh, uh, um, the same parameters of uh, material consumptions that we have nowadays. And we just made the projection with population and then we model uh, changes in the, in, the, in the parameters of a per capita consumption of uh, uh, materials uh, in the future. So uh, this is the context in, in which uh, we are. And uh, this in relation to water, it will mean that uh, the water footprint of cities is going to increase. And we are already in a context of a, 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 it's not that bad, 
the, the general water footprint in, in, in national terms, but when we go to uh, at the local level or specific uh, areas of the country, then we are already uh, experiencing huge problems. Uh, and as you can see in the map on the right, uh, a lot of the basins already present deficits uh, 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 and we have a, a lot of problems in Mexico City as well. Uh, right now we are under stress of water uh, because it, it hasn't rained a drop of water in the last month, so uh, we are at 25% of capacity. Uh, of, uh, so that would mean that the, the availability of water is compromised uh, for the following months. Uh, and when we go specifically to, to the Mexico City case, just to let you know what I'm talking about, uh, well, as you know, um, Mexico City is in the, in the center of the country. Uh, in the lower map on your left, you will see the, the basins that are a, 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 a strongly related to a, the a water service in Mexico City. Uh, and if you can see a, the, the map on the, on the top, that you, you can get to see how uh, these basins are related. The, the map below presents the Mexico Valley Basin and the, uh, the relationship with the Tula uh, Basin uh, and uh, the Panaco River, that those are the, the main sources of water. But then uh, we import uh, from the Kutsamala Basin and the Lerma Basin 30% uh, of, the, of the water that we consume. So it's a very complex system uh, that imports a lot of water. It, it, they, they, they need to, well, we need to pump water uh, one kilometer up to, uh, um, to Mexico City. And then we spell all the wastewater that is combined with rainwater in the same system to uh, the Tula Basin. Uh, but the, the, the case study, I mean, this is like the basin approach of uh, the case study, but the, the administrative, uh, just to put it like that, the administrative uh, delimitation of the case, it's related to Mexican Valley metropolitan area. So that's uh, the 76 local governments. And of course, now you can think about the huge challenge that we uh, are facing in terms of uh, coordination and collaboration as Sarah also explained for the case of other cities. Uh, so, uh, when uh, we wrote this chapter, we analyzed the, the inflows and outflows of water and the level of circularity of the system in uh, both cities, in, in Los Angeles and in, in Mexico City. In this case, uh, understanding Mexico City as the Mexico Valley metropolitan area. Uh, just to clarify that, Mexico City, uh, legally speaking, it, it relates only to these 16 municipalities uh, that uh, compose uh, pretty much what we can call the central city. Um, so what we have here is, I'm, I'm just gonna go very quick to the, uh, with the data. Uh, we have a, a certain amounts of inflows of water that come from rain. Uh, a third of the, of the amount of water, as I say, it comes from two uh, neighboring basins and uh, most of the water comes from the aquifer uh, of, their, uh, of our own uh, basin, the Mexico Valley Basin. And we import a lot of water that it's bottled. Uh, and this is a, a peculiar case because currently we were not on the first uh, rank, but now we're in the first place of a, a, a consumption of a bottled water worldwide. And this is new. Uh, this, uh, we learned this this year. We were in the top three, top five pl uh, places in the previous years. So we estimated that, and uh, we also estimated the, the different uses of, uh, of, of water by industry, by agriculture. We have a, a, an important part of the, of the territory uh, or it still uh, has agricultural activities. And uh, of course, more the, the urban uses of, uh, of water, meaning residential commerce and, and government. And the difficulty of the, of the, uh, of the case is that there are two entities that are uh, um, that 
manage the system. The, the SACMEX that is related to uh, Mexico City, these 16 central municipalities, and the CAEM that is uh, uh, the authority in charge of water in the state of Mexico. So uh, these two authorities operate uh, independently. Uh, we're talking about two different states with uh, different uh, political parties in charge. So uh, the, these features add to the complexity of uh, being able to successfully collaborate and coordinate efforts. Um, so the system is uh, pretty much composed by 600 wells providing about 75% of all water inflows. Uh, there is a, a a huge deficit in the uh, aquifer of the city uh, of about 28 uh, um, cubic meters uh, per second. Uh, as I said, we, we import a lot of water from the Lerma Kutsamala system. And uh, just to have you an, have an idea of the, the amount of water that we import, uh, uh, we, in ter I'm talking about uh, bottled water. It amounts about two hectometers of uh, um, cubic hectometers per year, uh, and this water is consumed by three fourths of a uh, population. So most of the population consumes uh, uh, bottled water. Uh, and the carbon footprint, just talking about the water nexus, uh, energy water and uh, carbon nexus. Uh, in the case of Mexico Valley uh, metropolitan area, uh, we estimated the carbon footprint related to, to the system. And uh, one of the things that were very interesting is that uh, the, the carbon footprint associated to the operation of the full system, it's pretty much the same as the carbon footprint associated to the, the level of consumption of bottled water. That's very interesting and uh, it can show us uh, why is very important, not only in terms of uh, uh, the, the polymers or the, the, the plastic waste that we generate, but also in terms of uh, uh, climate uh, actions that we can take uh, um, uh, by uh, reducing the consumption of uh, bottled water. Um, we also estimate the methane emissions of the wastewater that we generate. Uh, city, uh, treats just a, a very, very low percentage of, of the total uh, flow of wastewater. And uh, the, the peculiar thing of, of wastewater in Mexico, uh, in Mexico City is that uh, this flow has been used by uh, uh, agricultural activities. Uh, and this is the dispute that is a peculiar dispute by uh, uh, producers, local producers, that uh, feel that they will not be able to uh, access to this waste wastewater uh, to in order to produce uh, food and flowers, uh, because a, a huge pro project for uh, for installing a water treatment plant, uh, one of the biggest one in Latin America, uh, uh, has been proposed, and the the, the 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 treatment plant has been already. Uh, put in place an emotion, uh, and the dispute was related to the access because they felt that the water treatment was uh, uh, taking all the water that uh, uh, in the first place was uh, a health issue and the problem of the local population. They figure out a way of uh, living with uh, wastewater, and uh, now they are being uh, uh, excluded from this water stream. So it's kind of peculiar and there were manifestations, uh, popular manifestations uh, uh, associated to that. Uh, so, and lastly, climate change uh, is compromised in Mexico City water, water security. As I said, we are currently having uh, problems, but this is constantly uh, uh, the stress uh, of uh, water availability is becoming uh, uh, more uh, recurrent. Um, rains are, uh, the, the rain period is becoming shorter and water uh, and the precipitation is, 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 is becoming higher. So we are experiencing a lot of problems in relation to um, flooding. Um, just to give you an idea of, a, of the context in which a, this a water system operates, it's a, a, a highly uneven a metropolitan area. Uh, as you can see, the central city uh, presents lower uh, poverty uh, uh, percentage of, of, of people, and the higher uh, poverty is uh, related to the peripheral uh, uh, area of the of the metropolitan uh, uh, 
of the metropolitan area. And we did in 2019 an evaluation of local capacities. And uh, it was very interesting. I, I will not go into the details, but I, I just want to point out, first of all, that in general, we have a insufficient or very limited capacities a, a for a facing climate environmental a, issues at the local level. It's not only about water, it, it includes a, everything. Um, there is a, a, a lack of coordination uh, among the different local governments that uh, we could verify uh, by uh, having uh, interviews with different authorities from the different uh, local governments. And uh, one of the interesting things is that uh, the degree of vulnerability, uh, the climate vulnerability uh, recognized by uh, uh, the state governments and the national government do not correspond to the, clim the existing, existing uh, local uh, climate environmental capacity. So there is a, a huge mismatch between uh, local capacity, uh, local capacity building and uh, climate vulnerability that uh, uh, if this continue will be uh, of, uh, it will be very relevant uh, in the future. So for the case of uh, Mexico City, uh, the different challenges and, and opportunities uh, I'm just going to point out a few of them uh, are related to uh, the need of coordinating urban water governance, including planning infrastructure development and operation with land use planning. That's something that uh, uh, in the chapter, Ilan and I uh, uh, went through for both cases. Uh, uh, we need to protect the ecosystem at the basin scale. We're having a lot of problems with uh, ecological services in the metropolitan area, even in the, the central city, we are uh, losing the capacity of, uh, uh, of these ecosystems, not only to uh, gather water, but also of capturing carbon. Uh, we need to make more efficient uh, the, the, the system in terms of water energy carbon nexus. Uh, we have a huge problem in terms of leakages, about 40% of total uh, water inflows are lost uh, through leakages and the circularity that we present is very, very uh, limited. Um, we also need to expand uh, the water system as the city is uh, uh, keeps growing. Uh, and we need also to take a, a, in parallel a lot of a, a measures to, con to, to, to stop urban sprawling and it promotes certain density uh, and uh, what uh, UNEP is now calling the uh, strategic intensification uh, uh, within the city. And we have a huge uh, challenge in terms of uh, the amount of money we need to invest. Uh, only for the following decade, we need about uh, 7,000 uh, 7, million pesos. And uh, in addition to that, we need to improve the collection of, uh, the collection of water rates. About 88% of real users in, in the case of Mexico City uh, are uh, paying uh, their water service, uh, but only 65% has water meters installed. So that's a huge challenge uh, ahead. And finally, we need to promote uh, um, other technologies such as rainwater harvesting uh, systems, uh, particularly in areas with high hydrological poverty. And this is a, 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 a program that the current government is promoting. As you can see in the map, uh, without those systems, the, 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 the hydrological poverty is higher. That's the map on your left. And then it, with the systems, that poverty can be considerably uh, reduced. Uh, then uh, these are the, the, there are about 12,000 systems that have been already uh, installed in two different parts of two different uh, municipalities within Mexico City, and uh, this program is still is going on. So they are trying to promote this type of decentralized systems to address uh, uh, hydrological poverty. And uh, just to finalize, we need to also implement uh, different strategies to uh, reduce uh, climate vulnerability of the city. And as you can see, uh, a huge part of uh, Mexico City, the central city, uh, it's uh, vulnerable to a uh, flood. So I now leave the floor to Hilda for the uh, Los Angeles case. 
Thank you so much, Jan. Uh, unfortunately, we're very, very low on time. So Hilda, maybe you could just say a few words of summary on the Los Angeles case. Um, and then there'll be, it, we're so glad you're here so you can participate in the Q&A too. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, I, if you can uh, advance the slides to, uh, to the end of my, uh, my slides on LA. Next one, the next. Okay, uh, basically uh, the, uh, uh, the city of Los Angeles is facing uh, a, a very uh, momentous problem in that a very large percentage of its water comes from the snowpack uh, from the Sierra Nevada, uh, both uh, through the, uh, the state uh, water project that comes to us from the north and also from the LA aqueducts that uh, the city invested in beginning in the, in, in the 1910s. Uh, and so the majority of our water Let's see, about, oh gee whiz, uh, about 85% or so comes from imported water sources. And uh, these water sources, of course, uh, will be impacted by uh, climate change. As a matter of fact, if you go back to the, I think it was the last slide, uh, you will see that uh, the state, uh, uh, the, uh, the fourth uh, state's uh, climate assessment pretty much concludes that we will be losing about two thirds of the sources of water that we have been relying up upon uh, because of the falling snowpack. And so uh, both the city and the surrounding uh, uh, cities in Southern California will be faced with a problem, um, and probably my, by mid-century, the, the latest. Um, the other major problem is that financing the replacement of failing infrastructure, and I had a very nice slide of uh, all the water pipe uh, break-ins and, and the age of the pipes, uh, a good portion of them are now forgetting but more than 50% are 50, 75 years old. And so we have leakages all the time and so on. But the problem is that uh, with the tax limitation movement that California started, uh, Prop 13, it's very difficult for local governments to raise taxes to replace some of this infrastructure. And hopefully uh, President Biden's uh, uh, new uh, investment uh, plan will help us on that. Uh, the state has recognized water as a human right. It was the first state in the country uh, in 2012. And this became important because we, uh, when we had the big drought that ended in, in 2016, we found that there were many disadvantaged communities that had very poor uh, water uh, uh, supply sources. And so the, the state has committed uh, to invest in those, uh, in those agencies. And, and the, the other interesting thing about uh, the state of California and, and in particular, the Los Angeles uh, Department of Water and Power is that we have started a more holistic approach uh, to water resources management. And this is what it's called the One Water Project. And what's interesting is that it was started in the sanitation department because uh, the LA water system is managed by uh, a, a, a very special, uh, uh, a very special agency within the city. Uh, and so, the idea behind the One Water Project is that we have to become uh, more systems oriented, more holistic in the way that we plan uh, 
both, uh, I mean, uh, water supply, uh, water, um, uh, wastewater, as well as storm water, uh, especially as we will have to rely more and more on recycled water. And so th this is an approach that was started out of the sanitation department in the city, but that has been pretty much uh, accepted by the uh, leading agencies, uh, uh, in, you know, national water agencies, um, uh, associations across the country. And I, I think that's all the time I have. <laughs> yes, but that was great on the fly, despite all of the technical difficulties that you were able to just skip to the, the key takeaways. Um, so at this point, um, we are gonna switch to Q&A. We understand some folks may have to leave us, but we have about 15 more minutes for a conversation. And um, I, I, we have some great questions in the Q&A. Um, I'd like to have uh, Professor Barry Rabe, who is the uh, Ford School um, coordinator of this year's NAC on climate, ask the first question, and then we'll do one or two from the audience. Barry? Sure, thank you, Josh. And thanks to our panelists, thank you so much. This is just a really fascinating conversation. Thanks for enriching this for us. Um, one of the questions I just wanted to pose, and I'll try to make this quick, given the fact that there are other good questions waiting, um, is there was a lot of hope about a decade ago that we might see a lot of formal governance collaboration between American states, Mexican states, and Canadian provinces and all kinds of climate policy. To a large extent, that has not really materialized. But here, thinking about your point, Sarah, about kind of next generation urban climate engagement that cuts across these areas, are we beginning to see ways in which multiple local cities and jurisdictions in any of the three countries are beginning to formally work together and think about governance, or whether we're talking about the Mexican, Canadian, and or US cases, ways that jurisdictions are formally looking to partner and collaborate on any of the things in water or climate that have been talked about thus far? Or should we really think of each state city case as kind of independent or hermetically sealed? Thanks. I can I can jump in quickly. I think that the, so it's a great question. And the first thing that comes to mind is that I know of several examples of maybe more informal um, working together or or coordination or, or or maybe even more on that that learning kind of side of things. I remember talking to people in Toronto who had recently invited some folks up from. Uh, from, from New York City and a think tank in Washington that's eluding uh, me at the moment, right? They had invited them to come up to Toronto and tell them about what they'd been doing and how they might implement it in Toronto. So, so there was, there's definitely, and this is really common in cities in general, I think this idea of finding out what other cities are doing and trying to um, learn from that or kind of take what you can um, in that way. Um, I'm having trouble thinking of, of, a, of a more formalized example of, of coordinating um, and learning that way. Of course, there's examples within, within the US and within Canada of, of doing that kind of coalition building. Um, there's, there's, there's this kind of transfer and, and uh, of both people and ideas from city to city. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question. I, I can't think immediately of a, of, a, of a more formalized example. I don't know if um, the other panelists have, have examples. Yeah, just a, a small comment. I think there is a lot of opportunities uh, in starting with the binational cities or the sister cities along the, the border between the United States and Mexico. Uh, there's a lot of experience in terms of water there. Uh, but uh, we have different uh, regulation uh, schemes and um, underground water is, is starting to be studied in the United States. Uh, we will need to move forward uh, in an international, perhaps have a national agreement on underwater, underground water. And there are a lot of challenges ahead in terms of water vulnerability uh, between these, these cities. Uh, we have been studying the case of, uh, of El Paso and Ciudad Juarez, and that's a nice case because in, in, in times of uh, emergency, uh, El Paso has offered 
help to uh, Ciudad Juarez, but all these uh, customs uh, regulations and all these uh, the border regulations uh, that go beyond the custom uh, aspects have uh, been a, a barrier to actually set in motion the collaboration among two cities that are pretty much a, a, a continuous built environment in that case. So I think we, we need to explore further which mechanisms we can implement there. Hilda, did you want to add anything? No, not really. I, yes, uh, there's been a sister cities, uh, uh, you know, movement now for quite a, a number of decades uh, now, but, uh, you know, it's informal. Yes, you do learn from each other and so on, but it's, uh, it's very difficult to apply. Uh, you know, uh, a, uh, a model that worked in a, in a different uh, government context in, you know, uh, to, to, to another one. Uh, yes, we can learn some things from, uh, from such examples, but it's very difficult, I think, to uh, apply them. Great, thank you. Now, uh, thank you very much. I'm gonna ask a question um, that was actually asked by Professor John Chichari, who is um, the director of the International Policy Center here at the Ford School. However, with John's permission, I'm, I'm not gonna read it word for word because I wanna kind of tweak it um, so that we can make it more applicable to everyone's uh, talks, which is the question of um, public versus private ownership of utilities. And this includes water and electricity. Um, you know, both uh, Hilda and Sarah Hughes talked about the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power as a somewhat, at least in the US context, unique uh, urban um, uh, municipal utility uh, and, and how does that, how, but many cities in the US have private utilities like Detroit, which is served by DTE. Um, and then, you know, in Mexico, I'm much less aware, but I believe it's all a nationalized utility. So can each of you or, uh, talk about how the private public partnership plays into what cities are able to do for climate on climate? And whichever of you would like to go first, just jump right in. Sure, I'll, I'll jump in quick. I, I think um, it's a really good question. And, and I guess um, one way, in addition to the public private, I mean, this comes up a lot in, in urban environmental policy a lot, like, should we just give cities more authority is the answer here to just kind of put cities in charge or, you know, that let mayors rule the world, you know, Benjamin Barber's book. Um, I'm, I'm generally skeptical of that solution. Uh, you know, just did a broad sense as a broad blanket solution because we've got a lot of examples of cities um, really bungling things too, or you know, taking really um, uh, conservative or um, you know uh, anti-environmental stances on issues too. So I don't know that we can you know kind of count on that as as a as a as a for sure solution. You know, if we just gave more power to to cities, that we would see. Uh, but more, more action. It might be the case in, in, in some ways, um, but I think that it's a really, I, I get stuck on this question a lot, but I think in general, it's maybe learning from the successes that cities do have when, when they do have them and thinking about ways that they, um, that they, they might apply um, to the, to the, to the current power structures we have. That's probably where I would lean. Uh, I uh, can add a, a little bit to this. Uh, I think that the real problem is, is the fact that we don't really have a metropolitan governance. And, and of course, you know, uh, Mexico City, uh, the greater <laughs> metropolitan area of Mexico City is probably an exception. But uh, until, I, I think if we had metropolitan governance, then I, I think, yes, you could have uh, the, the type of agency as, uh, as we have here in LA, uh, the LA DWPs that, that for example, is now trying to completely uh, convert uh, to uh, green energy altogether, but it's, you know, it's 4 million people, but still is not metropolitan enough. It doesn't take in, uh, I, I had a, uh, 
a map at the beginning there that showed the consolidated metropolitan area. And the point I was gonna make is that, yes, it's a consolidated metropolitan area. Nevertheless, we don't have metropolitan governance. And I think that is uh, the, a major problem. If we had that, then I think, yes, we could have, you know, the large uh, water and, and power type of uh, institutions that uh, I think would be viable. But, uh, you know, that, that's a very big agenda, a very big issue. I, just to say something about Mexico, um, uh, and just to clarify, yes, we do have a, a metropolitan entity that is in charge of coordinating environmental issues. Uh, but in practice, well, it has just a few years operating and in practice is more focused on air quality than anything else. So uh, we, even though that we have that uh, incipient metropolitan governance, we have a lot of work to do. And certainly in terms of climate change and water, those are issues that have not been uh, fully addressed. Uh, and yes, we, we do have a, 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 a system that is centralized at the federal state, at the federal level uh, in terms of water and energy. Both of them are a, a, a federalized. Um, but cities have a, a, a some, some room to decide if they are going to go towards a private public partnership or if they are going to go to a fully privatized uh, um, model. And Mexico City is one of the cases. Um, the central city has a hybrid system. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the tariffs and the, the collecting of money, it's uh, defined by the local authorities and the private companies are in charge of the, of the system and uh, emitting the, 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 the bills, but they, they actually do not define the tariffs. And this is perhaps changing because a, a, a couple of contracts were not renewed in the last uh, weeks. Uh, so we will see what happens in terms of a, a, if the private partnership model is going to be a, a figure that will be still important in the in this government, I'm, I'm talking about the federal government. And the last issue I want to to add it, it's in relation to the possibility of a decentralizing a water systems that a, has a tension is that there is a trade-off between efficiency and a resilience of the systems that happens the same with energy. And there's a lot of things related to costs. When we decentralize with the centralized waste service, and we made that a problem of the municipalities, the problem that municipalities face were funding. So they need to work into a coalition of two, three different local governments in order to be able to even access to fund and uh, uh, buy this uh, and build this infrastructure that they need. So that's an, an issue that we also need to think when we are uh, thinking on the possibility of having decentralized systems or a hybrid uh, centralized decentralized system of water. Great, and on the topic of funding, that actually ties in beautifully to the final question, um, which is, you know, uh, directed towards Sarah, but Hilda and Gian certainly can add their thoughts. Um, you know, a lot of these city level climate initiatives do require revenues. Um, and uh, the questioner notes that Los Angeles recently put in a local sales tax, but that that has been criticized for being regressive. Um, the real question is, given cities limited power to raise revenues, obviously, there's property taxes as well. Do, um, do these kinds of climate related readiness for climate activities in cities ultimately require state and federal support financially? And if so, you know, how does that, how does the question of revenue play into all of this in terms of capacity? Sarah, you could go first. Sure. I mean, I think on the one hand, um, a short answer is, is yes. I mean, I think um, state and federal support is going to be needed for the big, you know, infrastructure transitions we're talking about um absolutely i mean it's still possible for you know state and federal revenue generation to have um you know equity impacts we're not happy with but 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 it, but in general i think that that funding is going to need to be made available in some way 
Um, and you know, this might be <laughs> this might be a bit of a cop out, but I think in 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 that example, you know, my main interest is how do you get how do you get the support you need for for a new initiative like that, right? So um, less debating the the what and and more uh, focusing on the how. You know that said, but I think that we want to be, of course, paying attention to the the instruments we're using, and and you know if they are. There's also going to be effects uh, on coalition willingness around those 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 instruments as well. Um, but like I said, yeah, I think short answer, absolutely, you know, those big investments are going to have to be part of um, coming from other places too. Yeah, for the case of Mexico, it's exactly the same. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, we also rely a lot on international funding. Um, so the, the mechanisms for funding uh, green investments or uh, uh, low carbon projects and stuff like that uh, are play a big role in, in our case. Uh, most of the climate change uh, um, actions, uh, concrete actions that are, are happening in the country are being funded either by uh, international banks or by um, international corporations. So they, they play a huge role uh, uh, on that. And perhaps one of the, the ways that we need to explore further is the, the value capture of a public investments in infrastructure. We, that's something that we haven't explored in Mexico. We have a lot of problems in terms of how the real estate market operates and the disconnection between the, 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 um, the tax that is imposed to the, to the property and the actual value on the market. So that's something that it's, uh, uh, um, it's something that we need to, to work on in the future. And it's very hard to do. Colombia is a good case of, of a kind of successful case on that. Hilda, you get the last word if you want it. Uh, you're, you're muted though. Right, uh, well, you know, uh, California may be uh, uh, kind of special around the country, but uh, we, the funding for uh, water infrastructure in particular, uh, has been for LA and, and Southern California has been uh, really stymied by by the tax uh, uh, limits on property tax, and so we have relied more and more on you know trying to replace and upgrade the water infrastructure on uh, uh, state bond issues, and they have been more and more difficult to obtain and take much longer when they actually do happen because we're dealing with a north-south type of issue where water comes from all the way up there and so on. And the people that live in the north of California say, well, you know, it's really the south that's benefiting from these um, uh, statewide bonds. And so uh, we have had a lot of problems uh, getting them uh, passed. Uh, and so, you know, we, <laughs> I, I think we're waiting for President Biden's uh, help <laughs> with this infrastructure bill. Um, right, uh, we have problems with the way that we finance uh, this infrastructure in California. Thank you. And as usual with these things, we could go on for several more hours, but considering that we're already 20 minutes over, thank you all so much for participating. We do have one last NAC webinar event scheduled for April 20th on the topic of citing renewable energy. And with that, a good afternoon to all. <laughs>